Sprig of juniper. Hmm. Yes. The gall pellet of a troll. Ugh. And the eye of Hicks. I thought it was a, a newt. Uh, I've already done the spell with the Eye of Nude. I've done it with the Eye of Hudson. I've done it with the Eye of Apalm. Hicks actually lost his eye. So I figured, listen, Jim, this is my homebrew spell, okay? Just can I please brew it how I want? Sure, yeah, why not? Homebrew spells on WebDM. This episode is brought to you by Swordsfall RPG's Kickstarter, Welcome to Tycor, your gateway into the Afro-punk genre. In this pre-colonial African world, deities and spirits are as real as the nature that surrounds them. This setting book is full of incredible art and detailed information on places, NPCs, and objects that can enrich any game. If you're looking for something different and new for your game, you need to check it out. Link here and in the description. Homebrew spells. Mm. Oh man. With the Spell School uh, series that we just finished and the yep. cornucopia of spells at your disposal, why do sure. it? I why, mean, yeah, why, why would a why player do, do, it? do it? It could be that perhaps you know, you've know uh, you played a, a couple of the um, 5th edition games, you've mostly played casters, you've, you've played all the, the good spells, right? <laughs> like you've played all the ones that everybody recommends that seem like they're good for their level or, or that, that, that appear to be popular, things like that. Yeah. You, you, yeah, you Becky with the good spell, which yeah. no one will get. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it's, uh, <laughs> maybe you've played around with a couple of themed casters and, and you know, you've massaged the spell system a bit uh, in order to make that work for you but you've, uh, you've hit that limit and you have now wishing to engage in the time-honored uh, tradition of <laughs> creating your own spells. And it really is, right? Like, this is a part of D&D's history. And if you look through the spell system, uh, Bigby, Mordenkind, and Tensor, Leoman, Rary, all of them, if it has a name in front of it, chances are that used to be a player character with yeah. a player who had a very specific need which that spell arose from. And it's very satisfying. But if you go looking for guidelines <laughs> and the like, uh, you might not have a lot, so it's, it's worth talking about it and considering the place of, uh, of homebrew spells in your game. When you're homebrewing your spells, Jim Davis, yeah. I mean, do you, do you have to put your name on it? I mean, you don't have to, right? Like, I, I, I kind of think you should. Uh, <laughs> really, you're going to really really go on an effort, though, yeah, right? Really, I start with the idea of it, right? And, and because I'm, I'm starting with the story of the spell is what they might, uh, you know, some people might call it. It's worth looking at where it fits into your world and how spell creation and the like can impact it. What are the ways in which you can... You know, you know, turn this act of mechanical, you know, homebrew into something that's an adventure and something that's part of your world. Okay, so what are uh, some of the like the narrative considerations that uh, that you should take into account? when yeah. making your own spells? It starts with class-specific considerations. You know, what's the difference between the various intelligence, wisdom, and charisma-based casters and their approach to inventing magic? It, or would it even be right to call it invention? Perhaps it's discovery or, or reclamation. These are very broad sort of thematic uh, concepts here, but if you're an intelligence-based caster, wizard, arcane trickster, eldritch knight, or whoever else <laughs> that might come out in the future. Maybe you need access to a library or a lab. Research and experimentation might be a part of this process. Retrieving ancient lore of some kind that's been lost or, or otherwise uh, inaccessible. That could be from summoned creatures and the like that you talk to or you know actual texts. And It doesn't even have to be a paper. It can be any number of things that you make your spell book out of. And if you're dealing with ancient magic, it might be very durable and inconvenient <laughs> to mm -hmm. transport. A spell engraved into a wall, for instance. Well, I was, you know. I was about to say, Say, you know, uh, if you're in the Stone Age, yeah, yeah. Your, your spell book might be six stone tablets. Yeah, that's like giant stone discs that you've <laughs> inscribed your runes on. And maybe those are the things that you need to complete your own uh, spell research. Uh, Wisdom-based casters might uh, involve meditation or contemplation. They might uh, seek out a holy relic and, and sort of uh, pray uh, with it or next to it or, or something. Perhaps the... the a specific uh, spell is revealed to them in nature or, or through the divine. You know, the player is homebrewing a druid spell, but in, in the game, the druid is contemplating. And it's only when the falling leaves of this particular grove uh, spell out a certain, uh, you know, runic syllable that they're able to, to get what they need mm -hmm. to uh, finally get that last piece of the spell and, and cast it, uh, things like that. So consider that, you know, it, it, 
Charisma it might be introspection. It might be a gift from a patron if it's a warlock or something, or, or perhaps a, a gift from an ancestor uh, if we're dealing with the bloodlines of sorcerers. Uh, it could be a result of training. One, one of the things about uh, charisma-based casters that I, I want sort of more of, and certainly whenever I play them, is the idea that they hone their natural talent. That it's not just a matter of raw power and, and the like, but that it's trained and shaped into something. So maybe the training produces a homebrew spell. All of these things are just sort of considerations. What is it mean to be uh, engaged in the act of spell creation in your world? Are there guilds that govern that kind of thing? Are there churches uh, who cover that? Is there a god uh, of spell casting and spells that you might seek inspiration or, or favor from? Those are things to kind of consider. And, and while you're considering them, that's when you start thinking about that gray area where we're mixing mechanics and, and the narrative and everything is, how long does all this take? Is this a downtime activity mm -hmm. that you will need to create downtime rules for? Because there's not a spell creation <laughs> downtime activity. You know, there's a research downtime activity, but not one specifically for, uh, for new spells. Is there going to be a cost? Uh, a lot of uh, ways that D&D has approached this in the past is to have a fixed plus a variable cost. Yeah, right. You know, X amount of gold pieces per level, and then a, another sort of more random uh, element on top of that in order to emulate the chaotic and, and trial and error process that might go into one of these well, things. Well, yeah, just like the investment cost for research itself. There's a lot of different ways you can calculate the cost for these things, and D&D &D has done it many different times over the years, and I, I think you're going to just find something that works for your group. And it, yeah. it, ultimately, it, this is a, a source for, say, a uh, money <laughs> sink. You know, like there's a lot of people who have complained that, that Fifth Edition doesn't have that built-in what do we do with the character's money uh, that just accumulates and then can be an yeah. issue. After a certain level, it's like, well, start an IRA. Right. right. A trust fund for your children. <laughs> exactly. Other things are like, do you want special ingredients or something like that to be uh, factored into uh, the research of the magic or, or the cost? I've never really found a satisfactory like list of magical ingredients to use in magic item and spell creation. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the first edition DMG and Dungeon Master support products have short lists like this, but th there's nothing that's like comprehensive or anything. Although I know that there's a few uh, products on the DMs Guild that sort of like take the monster manual and go like, what can we make out of these things? But they may be more like food oriented than spell research oriented. <laughs> well, there is, yeah, there is a growing, uh, a growing hunger, yeah, we shall say, yeah, for, yeah. for materials such as that. Like, I want to sure. eat my monsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds like a digestion, digestion spell is in order mm -hmm. uh, for all those monster eaters. The big one, right, the final thing that I want to end on with, with like narrative considerations for your campaign and turning spell research into an adventure everyone can participate in, because that's the goal of this, is, is to go like, yeah, if we do it as a downtime activity, it, it's something that happens in between sessions. We maybe roll on a little complication table or something. If you turn it into an adventure, you've got to go somewhere. You've mm -hmm. got to seek something out. You've got to find someone to teach you a principle of magic that you need to further advance in your research. You've got to find a piece of ancient lore that's the key to, to, to what you need. Now you've taken it from a solo activity between one player, or a duo rather, between one player and the DM, and you involve the rest of the uh, rest of the group. And that's where things like in NPC trainers and lore sources come from. There are maybe rivals who are looking for similar information and conducting similar research. Or who are just trying to spy on you and your research. Exactly. Some nice yeah. like magical, like, uh -huh. like industrial, magical espionage. Exactly. Uh -huh. And if you have assistance, then they, those uh, assistants might be caught up in all of those shenanigans as well. Uh, and of course the party uh, uh, can get involved. And so th the idea, the, the sort of the ultimate source of this is the quest. And the idea that you are going to need special ingredients talk to a special NPC, go to a special location to learn this thing. And perhaps the spell that is crafted, homebrewed, is warrants, you know, needing all of these things. There's one special ingredient, though, that I think everyone who's involved in, like, wizardly intelligence-based research uh, should consider, and that is the brains of dead wizards. Because if these brains are meant to contain the magic mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, of these casters, then surely when they die, there's magic left over in those brains of theirs. And perhaps you could coax that out of them, or there's a magic item that you could use to uh, you know, gain uh, part of that information or, or, you know, any number of weird mm -hmm. and, and esoteric uh, things you can do with the brain of a dead wizard. I mean, I, I think that research was done and that was where zombies were first created. The wizard decided, I'll eat his brains. You know, it could be themed pretty strongly, right? If this is a necromancy spell, then obviously having the organ of a dead wizard who is responsible for all of this 
necrotic energy mm -hmm. being brought about and created is itself suffused and might even be a magic item in and of itself. So yeah. just a, a, a little thing to consider as you... Yeah. <laughs> Researching the spell Lecter's, Lecter's Lecture. Right. So. Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> If you want to give a speech on something that's kind of creepy, but full of information. The goal of all of this is to turn it into an adventure and bring the rest of the party in so that it's not uh, something that they don't have a say in or, or a chance to participate. But when it comes to the act of like actually homebrewing a spell, there's very little guidance and, and not a lot when you go back and look through other editions for just any kind of guidance yeah. at all, really. Yeah, fifth edition is what, like three or four paragraphs? At, at, at best. Yeah. It's like a four bullet point uh, list of guidelines and and they are guidelines you should consider. There are things like, you know, look at, uh, uh, you know, other spells that, that are uh, in the level or that might have a similar effect. Or one of them that I think is particularly interesting is, uh, is one that admits that there's probably way more spells that exist in these worlds than is actually in the D&D game, but that the, you know, the, the spells that are in the game are those that the players are most likely to pick or that these other spells that are in the world are just too situational and too whatever to ever be chosen. I'm kind of of the opinion that we should let the players make that decision and to present the world mm -hmm. as it sort of is, then allow the players to sort of pick which parts of it interest them and, and build a, a campaign from that. It's worth reading those. There's a chart uh, that, that has some uh, guidelines for damage per level, which you can also sort of inverse for healing per level. Uh, you'll notice there that Fireball is probably somewhere between a fifth and sixth level spell, uh, just based on damage alone. Yep. Uh, there's a reason for that, obviously. It's a iconic spell that they want you to cast off. <laughs> it does sort of uh, give you an insight into the ways in which you can manipulate the parts of a spell to produce uh, a, a different effect or to emphasize something or to highlight something that uh, the magic is supposed to accomplish. In this case, burn the crap out of your enemies. Taking those considerations in, what, yeah. what else should a, a, a prospective player think about when, sure. when homebrewing their spells? Though? Right, and those guidelines are in chapter nine uh, of the DMG. Uh, by the way, if you're looking for those. Right behind the creating monsters uh, section. It, they're easy to miss because yeah. they, they're barely a uh, full page. But some things to consider are, number one, is there a, an existing spell that could be reflavored or, or retweaked in some way to produce the thing that you're looking for? I'm looking to play a, a focused elementalist type and I want all cold damage. I'm looking at the spells and I'm going, man, there's some cool like frost damage cantrips that I can have. And, you know, ice knife, it, you, you know, it's in low level AOE. If, if you need, you know, if you need it, but you're really looking at some of the better spells and going like, why can't these just do cold damage? This is the option for that. You know, just like the spell research there is just a, a tweak to something. You're probably not doing very much uh, to actually change the spell, and so there shouldn't be that much involved if you even require this to be like a research thing at all. And it's not just like, yeah, you know a version of this spell because it exists, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we both just allow players, like, if you want to cast Fireball, but it's cold or yeah. thunder. Yeah. Okay. I, right. So, I mean, like, part of the reason, the justification for why Fireball does so much damage is that fire is a fairly commonly resisted uh, damage type. And I can see that if you're not changing anything about your monsters, that holds true. But you can change the damage type on even something like Fireball. If you're worried about the 8d6, maybe bump it down to 6d6. But you can probably get away with it being almost any kind of damage, and it's not going to really break the game. There might be certain edge cases <laughs> where it's, uh, you know, where the, the fact that now it does, I don't know, radiant damage is a big deal. You're not going to crack the rules over your knee and, and be, have an unplayable game if you reskin the damage types or something. Same with just sort of the general theatrics of a spell. Naming a spell, like you were mentioning earlier, like just attaching your name to it, is a great way to reskin magic without touching any of the mechanics. Yeah. Because a spell like uh, Finnegan's Fiery Finger is very different than Fireball. It, it suggests a, a wizard that encounters violence enough that they need this massively damaging spell for its level to mm -hmm you know, to exist. And what does that say about this particular mage? What is the reputation that this mm -hmm. spell has? If you name a spell and tie those to archmages and powerful casters that are in your setting, you've drawn the rules and the fiction of your world closer together. You've now created NPCs that have these spells. What sort of uh, relationship with the rest of the world do they have? Fun things that you can do just by naming spells and changing nothing else about them mm -hmm. other than this is the guy that invented this one. This is the person who invented these spells. What if a player wants to kind of cross-pollinate from a other class? 
that's another option, right? Like you might look at a you know spell that's on a different class list and go, why isn't it on this particular one? Those guidelines in the DMG do offer some insight into this. There are some thematic boundaries that are usually respected when it comes to magic in Dungeons and Dragons, and it's part of what gives D&D magic its flavor. The fact that there's arcane magic and divine magic, and that they have two uh, roughly non-overlapping spheres of, of sort of a core elements, right? Most of divine magic bolsters, heals, supports, and protects. Not all of it. Flame strike, spirit guardian, spiritual weapon, guiding bolt, all those are reflect the divine might of the, uh, you know, of your various gods pantheons channeled through the caster. Whereas arcane magic is usually greater in scope and, and perhaps more powerful, but it's in a different way, right? I, I don't think anybody would argue that clerics are underpowered or that their magic is, is not you know, up to snuff. But it's clearly of a different sort than, yeah. you know, wizards. Thinking about that is, is, is one consideration, but maybe you want to blur those lines, or maybe you want to have more cross-pollination in that respect, and you allow various casters to research other uh, classes' spells as their own to reflect that. If you don't want to do a lot of work, mechanically speaking, that is, you know, you don't want to actually like, come up with the mechanics of a spell. If you are looking to do that, though, <laughs> yeah. if it were me, I'd start with the idea of modifying something about an existing spell. We already have like two ways of doing this, right? There's uh, feats like um, Elemental Adept or Spell Sniper or Metamagic from, uh, from Sorcerers. And I got to thinking, right? Like my chief uh, criticism of Sorcerers is that they keep <laughs> Metamagic for themselves and in return they gave up spontaneous casting so that everybody else could have it. And I liked it when the situation was reversed. What I might do in, in still allowing Sorcerers to have that uh, that sort of theme of being connected to a raw magical power and that giving them some uh, a different take on magic, that you might allow metamagic spells for other classes to be researched as independent spells. I want this particular spell cast, you know, as if I was using this metamagic option. And then you would have to probably rebalance the level for that. We'd want to look at, say, all right, what part of those components am I changing? Is it a subtle spell that I'm now casting? Am I trying to get like a subtle charm? That's probably not a first level spell. You could look to third edition in which metamagic effects did increase the level of the spell for some inspiration there. Or you could just kind of like wing it. What does a charm person that doesn't have any visual or, or, or auditory effects look like? And do you think that's a second level effect? Third level? A lot of this stuff is just eyeballing it. Yeah. And yeah. the real secret of this is that there's not any hard and fast rules for modifying or even creating existing spells by like changing their mechanics. A lot of it's just feel. But I think that it's worth it to do so because if you allow spells that exist, uh, you know, the majority of the campaign world, they exist one way, but for this character, they exist another way. Maybe they know a fireball that can overcome fire immunity, or they have a teleportation spell that takes them just a little further, or that allows them to alter something of it. They have a, a conjure spell that gets them a specific entity that works just a little bit way differently than the way the, the conjure spells work. Giving those out and presenting those to players is a way to reward casters without giving them magic items and gold and things like that, adding a different spell to their list or a modified spell. Uh, but it's also a way to reflect changes in the player, or, or sorry, rather the character. I'm thinking of the when we ran our Out of the Abyss game, our necromancer in there trained for a long time with a dragon and, and studied fire magic with a, a red dragon. And I just decided, I was like, you know what, take the elemental uh, adept feat for fire just have it as a freebie. And that represents your training with this dragon and a, and a closer understanding and mastery of fire magic. Those are the things you can do to both reward the players and start, begin, to customize, um, begin to customize the spells to get something that you want. So what are some other options to consider? So there is the time-honored way of a player writing out the spell, writing what they want the spell to do, uh, writing it up as if it were presented in the player's handbook. Basically everything but the spell level. Uh, what's the casting time? What components are there? What's the range and area? Duration, etc. And then the dungeon master reading that and going, that looks like an X level spell. Yeah. That's the advice that was presented in first edition D&D. If you're familiar with Matt Colville's Strongholds and Followers book, the, the section on modifying spells and the like sort of outlines a process like that. Similarly, before presenting an alternative, uh, which is really kind of cool. Um, and, and it's a time-honored way because it's really sort of the only way. There's no guideline for this, really. And, and even between editions, the levels of spells change and, and what a particular spell is allowed to do and not do changes. So it's even difficult to like 
go back to prior editions of D&D and make one-to-one -one, uh, correlations here. The easiest way is to just look at this ability that a player wrote up and think about it and go, well, this seems like a third level spell. Let's try that out for a while. If it looks like it's, you know, too good or, you know, you're, uh, you know, it doesn't reflect the, the general power level of other spells that are there, then we can tweak it. You know, particularly if you're not looking to publish one of these things and this mm -hmm. is just for your group, like this is a process, not a, uh, you know, we, we did this one thing and now we're done. You know what I mean? You, you always want to tweak and, and get a feel for things because a lot of times this game balance and, and fitting something homebrewed into your game is way more art than science. And you really need to just play and see what happens and make adjustments. Things to consider when you think about a level of a spell are like, what sort of action does it take to cast? A spell that's a bonus action or a reaction, uh, particularly if it's a bonus action, right, is generally weaker for their level uh, because you can cast them quickly. Think of something like the difference between healing word and, and cure wounds, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is takes an action, cures more. You're beginning to sort of see the kinds of considerations that you would need uh, to make here. Casting times seem to follow a set pattern of like, it's a certain type of action, whether action, bonus, or reaction, it grows from there with like minute casting times, 10 minute casting times, and so on up to like 24 hour uh, type spells. You know, if you want a spell that's like has appearance of being ritual magic without it, the availability of it always being ritual, you can increase the casting time there. Perhaps like get a higher level effect at a lower level because it's taking longer to cast. Uh, same with costly material components. If a really big expensive item uh, is consumed in the casting of a spell, then that spell can probably do something that's really more powerful yeah. because it's limited by your access to this material component. If it just requires a one-use material component, then it's probably more powerful if, than if it didn't require one, but it's still, you know, uh, not, as, not the most powerful thing. And again, with like the other components, does it require verbal, somatic, and material? That's a lot. You know, you have to have a hand free to both hold the focus or the components, plus one to make the gestures. You know, you have to be able to speak. What does the spell do at higher level slots? Uh, it, does it uh, become permanent if cast more often? What classes have access to it? Looking at all of those things and comparing them to other spells is just how it has to be done. And there's really, like I said, there's really no other way. It's, it's more just getting, uh, getting used to it and doing it and realizing you're gonna you know, mess up and it's all right. And the fun is in figuring it all out. And mm -hmm. at the end of it, you have a custom spell that only this caster knows. Mm -hmm. And they can use it to solidify a theme about their caster or make, or make them stand out from the rest of the setting. There's all kinds of implications for that because once it becomes known that this caster has a, a new spell that, that's, uh, you know, no one else knows, then they might be courted by beings that are much more powerful than them. They might find themselves in some trouble if they have a really good spell that fills a niche that others want. Fine. So, I'm you just, know, I'm just thinking of the, we come the, back around to making this an adventure. Yeah, you know? so I'm just thinking of the inadvertently uh, annoying, which is like all the knowledge spirits and creatures that just want to know. They just want to know. Because what this new there? knowledge is in the world. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what's we that? sense yeah. that it's here. Yeah. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want anybody knowing about this. Yeah, yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah. And now you've inadvertently made an enemy. <laughs> or you could be like a case of like, what if your familiar sought you out? You know, <laughs> I was like, yeah, listen, I'm uh, auditioning to be your new familiar. We can get rid of your old familiar. I'm mm -hmm. much better than that, per, you know, than yeah. that stupid squirrel. Speaking of familiars, right. like uh, recently in Star Wars <laughs> Bound, I let our arcane trickster cast Find Familiar in a slightly different way because oh, sure, right. he wanted a flump. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why he wanted a flump, but he wanted a flump Why and I'm flumps? like, well, it's not, I mean, yeah, they got a little <laughs> extra, but I don't care, whatever. I don't care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just had him make uh, an, Arcana, uh, an Arcana roll and he got a decent score on it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you you know the uh, the basics to kind of alter this to try to call a specific thing. Right, and that's the other thing is like, are you trying to cast a new spell or create a new spell for a one-time thing? My restrictions for that would be much more lenient. Yeah. You know, if a player was like, I just want to do this once, not every time. I cast the spell, then I might just be like, well, spend your inspiration or, you know, yeah. come up with a die roll. So that's a good point. Yeah. Well, and luckily, it, narratively, it worked because there was an asteroid. It's like, if they found that, I wouldn't be sad. Now he just summoned it from there. And so he's like, oh, yeah, it came from over there. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. since there he you. didn't actually like conjure it from, from nothing, he conjured it from a, a space. You know, a lot of times this process produces real conflicts between the players and DM, and particularly if, if it's just like the player goes off by themselves and, and like, hey, I made some stuff, like, let me use it. Especially after gold blooming. Homebrewing spells and other things highlights why 
establishing good communication with your group and, and establishing trust and, and you know all of those markers of good play is so important because it can smooth out a lot of the difficulties that arise from this. Because what if you've got other players at the table who are, say, jealous that one player is making homebrew spells and maybe they don't have the time to do that or they don't have the inclination and, and, and they you know sort of resent the fact that this one player has custom spells and, and maybe they see them as more overpowered or, or something compared to the ones they have. It's like if you're not talking to each other and, and establishing that, that the game is uh, for everybody and that if one player is doing something, then obviously it's extended to the other players, to the DM, if they can help them, or perhaps the other player could help that player. And oftentimes when you see people who say, like, don't homebrew or don't introduce homebrew, a lot of it comes down to social conflicts that result from the fact that this is a negotiation with the game rules and the players, and we've got to, we should talk to each other. Yeah as we get down, you know, as we work together. And the fighter's Gosh. like, why can't I negotiate my strength to be higher? Yeah. I want to homebrew my dexterity score. <laughs> yeah, probably ways to get that ways higher. Ways to do that. Sure, sure. yeah. Uh, and yeah. like a lot of things in Dungeons and Dragons, it's something that seems sort of simple at first, oh, just do it, that when you really dig into it, can become more complex. That complexity shouldn't uh, stop us from attempting it because there's a lot of uh, really fun things to be had from homebrewing your magic. So do you have any... Uh you have any homebrew spells like? I do. Yeah, I, I actually homebrew a lot of magic. <laughs> uh, what's what's what's, uh, what's so an example? I, I right. made uh, a couple recently, or recently for our Land Between Two Rivers in uh, for my Chronomancer. Mm -hmm. uh, Chronomancer was a you know he has a lot of time related abilities. He can like sort of call a future version of himself into being, and now there's two of them. It's like a a short-term simulacrum, basically. A chrono beam that both damages and ages the target and stuff. So I, I turned some of them into spells, but the one that I liked the most and that it took me the longest time to like get right was an, uh, one called Rewind Time, which is a fourth level uh, transmutation effect. For a minute, it lasts for concentration. You create this bubble and in the area, anything that happens in the area during that duration, you can edit once as a reaction. The, the way the spell is worded is like you can uh, reverse the impact of an individual combatant's turn. Did they make a bunch of attacks and do a bunch of damage? That damage is reversed. They never made those attacks. They never made that movement. They don't get their actions back, but they do get any spent resources back as that is sort of like rewound. And uh -huh. that stops the spell. Once you use it once, it stops it. But it was an ability that I'm like, it's just a short-term rewind. Just like, nope, we're going to just like tap that 15 seconds back button. Quick, uh -uh, nope. So, so Jim, <laughs> in, in essence, and I mean this in every sense of the word, you created a, a buff spell, like a buffering spell. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I used it once in combat uh, against the party, and, and the party barbarian had gotten a really good uh -huh. hit in. I remember and I was this. Like, nope. <laughs> and as soon as I heard the damage, I was like, re "We're gonna uh, using my reaction to reverse that." Uh, but I haven't had a player use it yet, although I'm, I'm eager to see. I have mm -hmm. a bard who learned it, uh, and, and we'll see uh, we'll see what it looks like when uh, when she uses rewind time. Ooh. Uh, the other ones I, I, I've come up with are more uh, lower level, uh, and they were ones for um, my arcane trickster in your spelljammer game. And, I found that there were a, a lack of spells related to stealth and spycraft mm -hmm. in Dungeons and Dragons. And so I created uh, two that are, are sort of related to that. One of them is um, for 10 minutes, you create a zone that prevents eavesdropping. Magically, anybody could look in here, and if someone just sit down and look at what you're doing or listen to the conversation, they would hear it. But the next table over is not going to know what you're talking about. More importantly, the spy trying to keep hidden across the room is not going to be able to overhear anything. Not going to be able to surreptitiously see something or, or catch a, a glimpse of something they shouldn't see. Not only, not only does it <laughs> does it dub you to something else, it dubs your lips. It dubs your lips and everything. Else. Yeah, it, it does everything that yeah. Mundane just eavesdropping is impossible with it. That's Zelo's confidential conversation. And then the other one is Zelo's subtle shadow, which turns bright light into dim light within a thirty foot radius around you. One minute concentration. And so it's kind of a spell where maybe your arcane trickster is getting like cornered. You know. No, it's like, no, the shadows deepen, and, well, wait a second, you thought he was there, but mm -hmm. you look and he's not, and Batman's out of there. Yeah, he goes full Batman. Right, right. And, and I wanted those two, because I saw, particularly with those two for my Arcane Trickster, um, as I saw whole, uh, something missing in the magic system. And to me, the biggest thing about homebrew is, is finding something that's missing in the magic system and adding it in and, and, and creating something to fill that uh, fill that niche. How about you? You have any homebrew spells you've had to deal with? Other than the uh, the fine familiar, yeah. um, uh, Greg also create, came up with a 
It's somewhere between like a feather fall in space and a tensor's floating disc. He likes to hop on catapults and be catapulted on the ships and uh -huh. he wants to take people with him. Uh -huh. So we kind of just cut the, the weight of tensor's floating disc kind of in half. It's like, all right, you can take one person and they will basically stay like 10 feet behind you as you, as you fly by. rock it out. And that, that's it. It's just like a one-time thing. It lasts a round yeah. and that's it. Yeah. Um, and so I, I let that I let that slide at, at first level because you're cutting the duration completely down. And basically, it's kind of like levitate for a very short time. Yeah, it's like a one I mean, round kind of levitate thing. Yeah. I, well, I mean, see because that. if you hang on to the person levitating, you can accomplish the same thing. Right. Right. But right, yeah. it's it's just a thing where it's like a magical tether. Yeah. Um, so we kind of did that, and I allowed that. There's always been a spell that I've had in my head for like like a magical assassin, like a, a wizard that yeah. likes to kill and like keep people off off base. Yeah. The name I have in as a placeholder smoke dart and you conjure smoke Ooh. to form like a like an actual whether it's a dagger yeah. or a sword uh -huh, or whatever uh -huh. and you attack with that and if you kill them with it yeah it's fine but then smoke dissipates right 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 and any trace of the actual item you won't know but you look at it oh it looks like they were killed with a sword but no one here everyone here was disarmed but everyone here was yeah, disarmed yeah. Uh -huh. and like so it's it's one of those things where it's like you know if there's witnesses whatever but Ooh. it's kind of the idea i've always had where you could try to attack and, and kill someone but you're not actually using a sword you don't need proficiency with a sword right 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 um but it would be like it would kind of be like a, a spiritual weapon for a wizard uh, but it's like sure. it's but it's a it is a complete construct. Some it's not quite a shadow blade. The point of the shadow blade is that it's like psychic and yeah. and, and sort of like uh, you know the, to project the yeah no 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 this does yeah, this slashing is... this does piercing this does yeah. bludgeoning, but the actual construction of it is purely magical and could the weapon itself overcome magical resistances? Mm. I mean, that's See? the big one, I right? Mean, like, that's the thing is, I, I, if it's like a spiritual weapon, it just does force damage and not. Uh, Here's the thing I'm thinking of. You know, it's a spell that it, it conjures this shadow or, or, cl or cloudy weapon kind of thing, conjuration magic, but maybe like the point of it is that it overcomes all resistance, right? Like it's the assassin's weapon, right? Like yeah. there's nothing you can do to stop this thing. It, it will pierce through every damage resistance and leave nothing behind, right? No one's yeah. gonna find the weapon and use it against you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that to me, that's like a, that's better than a magic weapon. So it's greater than second level. Yep. And, and it's, I mean, it's technically better than spiritual weapon, so it needs to be better than second level. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if it moves independently, then that's a big thing. But if you have to hold it in your hand at least and then just make a melee spell attack or uh, instead of a ranged spell attack. Uh, my gut says it's probably fourth level, mm -hmm. uh, and depending on how long it lasts. If it lasts an attack, right, if it's meant for like a one use, I, I've attacked with it, then probably, I, I actually would probably make that like a second level spell. Because uh, it's like See, a, a one, I, I don't know, one round thing. But. Yeah, and it would ha it would and it would need to for it to be worth a damage, it would need to do a, a substantial amount of damage. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, if it's meant to like a, assassinate for one attack. a target. Yeah, yeah. So that could potentially boost it up much higher than than those levels. You know, but if you're just creating like a weapon that can overcome resistance, doesn't do any extra damage, something else is going to provide the damage boost, then you might make it lower. But you could also just be like, oh, this is like a seventh level spell. This thing is yeah kills things right you know and that's the point but it, the point is to surreptitiously kill them so it's like yeah that's the whole point is like it doesn't look like they were killed with magic unless you know like oh no no there are spells yeah that can perfectly emulate weapons yeah yeah, yeah yeah um, yeah you know you but you cast detect magic nothing. and there is no magic left behind right there's nothing yeah I, I, that, that part of D D like the solving of mysteries and like having weapons or having magic like contribute to that. It's one of my favorite parts about D&D, &D. and so a mm -hmm. weapon that's like, yeah, that would leave everybody's head scratching as to like, well, how did this person die? Mm -hmm. And that, oh man, now I'm just thinking of all kinds of different things. How could they die from a spells. single sword thrust? Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. This is a mighty warrior. Yeah, a mighty warrior that, uh, that's fallen, you know, maybe it also clouds their minds so that you can't, <laughs> you can't just ask them uh, mm -hmm. later or, you know, or, or bring them back and, and ask them who did it. Um, I, I like spells that sort of cancel each other out because then they, they suggest a, a sort of arms race amongst magic, right? Like non-detection and all the scrying spells mm -hmm. or mind blank, similar. It is difficult to like just off someone, assassinate someone in Dungeons and Dragons without, you know, all of this divination magic being brought to bear. That assassin can wear and, and use certain things to keep uh, out of that divination magic, but what if it was the spell that they used, you know, to, to do the deed that actually covers their tracks? You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think of some other things that are like that sort of fill a gap that's not there. 
uh, magic that we mentioned, I think, in, in transmutation uh, episode, like allows for stretching and elongation. Yeah. Those would be good subjects for homebrew spells, multi-school spells. Anything that deals with time, time travel, uh, is to me up for fair game. It's a trope that I like using, a, a, a feature of the fantasy and sci-fi that I think is really fun, and I like the challenge of integrating it into a, a campaign, and so chronomancy is definitely something I want to see more of. I don't know what else. Summoning objects? That kind of thing? Or mm -hmm. everyday magic is another one, but there's endless possibilities. Yeah, I mean, we all could right. we could we could talk all day every day. BS and brainstorm about like, you know, a bunch of different spells. But doing this as a dungeon master, not as a player, is uh is something that uh you can engage in that will help enhance your world. Um and, and bring things to life. You can do more showing with custom spells you make than telling. Mm -hmm. um, because, you, you know, a spell represents time and effort put in by someone to create, meaning that this thing in the world has an impact on them. So it's so fun and, and, and such a, uh, a, a great way to sort of like spend some time and, and you get to share it with the players. And it's just great, uh, great fun. So, yeah, homebrew those spells. And let us know which ones you've homebrewed. Yes, really cool. yes. Yeah. Let us know about your artisanal homebrews. Artisanal. Handcrafted. Handcrafted homebrew. Home brew. It's not just for dwarves anymore, homebrewing. No. Um, no, it isn't. Head on over to Patreon for our weekly podcast and so much more. WebDM is also on Twitch with three weekly games, which we upload to WebDM Plays, our second YouTube channel. There was this uh, list in, our, in the third edition Unearthed Arcana where you could use special ingredients to affect certain yeah. metamagic effects on your spells without raising the spell slot level. And it was like, use a fire opal to cast fire spells to maximize them, or things oh, yeah. like that, you know? And I, I'd like to track that back down because that was a cool list of like, lot, just things you could add to your spells, material components to add to get different effects. A wand. Like, I got this wand. It changes my spells. Yeah. How are we 